Welcome to another VSG Expanded video. This video is a companion to the Edge Connect SD-WAN hub design chapter in the Validate Solution Guide. You can read this chapter in the VSG, as well as other great content, by following the links in the video description below. This video discusses how to design hub locations in our SD-WAN deployments and how to connect SD-WAN gateways at those hub locations. Let's dive in. We first need to define what a hub location is. A hub is a location that hosts resources that end users access, like a data center, or a well-connected regional point of presence that we use to design regional routing. With regional routing, we can scale to larger deployment sizes by providing full mesh IPsec SD-WAN tunnels within a given region, and then provide tunnels between the hubs in other regions. If we hop over to our orchestrator, we can see this all in action. Within orchestrator, you can define regions and then assign your gateways to those regions. When you bring gateways onto the network, you can define them as hubs, as we've done here. And then within the business intent overlay, you define hubs for each given region. So here we have the default region with two hubs. You can see we can also define our additional regions and define hubs there and configure the specific regional settings uh, using the dropdown up here. Then within the topology for each BIO, we define the meshiness. You'll notice two specifics we have here are the regional mesh and the regional hub and spoke. So we can build full mesh within our region and then build hub and spoke connectivity between our regions or simply have hub and spoke within our region and hub and spoke between the regions. Now that we've covered the foundation of what a hub is and how it can help us scale our SD-WAN deployments, let's dive into some design considerations. First, let's look at the hardware selection at the hubs. When selecting a gateway for the hubs, several factors need to be taken into consideration. The first factor is the bandwidth requirements. Assess the expected amount of traffic that the gateway will need to handle. Features like IPS and IDS can increase the load on the gateway. You can see normal expected SD-WAN bandwidth in the chart here, and the impact of IPS and IDS in orange. Ensure the selected model can handle the anticipated traffic volume, especially when enabling these features. Next, evaluate the number of IPsec tunnels that need to be created. This will depend on the number of branches you have and the meshiness of your environment. Different gateway models offer varying levels of support for IPsec tunnels. Ensure to choose the gateway that can accommodate the required number of tunnels. This information can be obtained from your Aruba SE. Third, consider the connectivity options. Consider how the gateways will connect to the WAN and LAN. Higher end models often provide SFP ports offering flexibility in physical media types for the WAN and LAN connectivity. Most customers will look at the medium, large, or extra large variants of the gateways. Virtual can also be an option with the proper infrastructure. Consult the SD-WAN reference architecture section of the VSG for more detailed guidance on selecting the appropriate gateway based on your specific requirements and configuration. The next design consideration I want to discuss is how you deploy the SD-WAN gateways into your hubs. There are two deployment options. You can deploy the gateways in line, meaning all the traffic has to traverse through the SD-WAN gateways to get to the WAN, or you can deploy them out of path, where we have other devices acting as the WAN edge, and our SD-WAN gateways are deployed off of a core layer or services block. In this scenario, we use an IGP, like OSPF or BGP, to attract traffic from the LAN destined to a branch location or other SD-WAN location into our SD-WAN gateways. And then we'll encapsulate the traffic in IPsec and forward it out through our existing WAN edge devices. Inline deployments are the most common as it reduces the number of WAN devices and simplifies the topology. This is a great choice for medium-sized environments. Installing hubs in an inline deployment requires a hard outage as you replace the devices at your WAN edge and you must carefully consider how routing will function during the migration for communication between sites that are on the new SD-WAN overlays and legacy sites using your existing WAN solution. We'll talk about migration in a bit more detail later on. Larger environments or environments that want dedicated WAN edge devices may choose to use the out of path model. This model makes it easier to scale out the number of SD-WAN gateways you have to meet your bandwidth requirements. The out of path model can also help simplify migrations with no hard outages to replace WAN edge devices and can make the migration routing a bit more straightforward. Additionally, many customers will leverage the out of path model during proof of concepts as it's easy to drop in the SD WAN gateways into the hub without major changes and then convert a few branches. 
Let's look at a common deployment scenario. Here we have two hubs with a backend interconnect. Let's discuss more design considerations. For the inline deployment model, a high availability mode referred to as traditional HA is recommended. In this model, all of the various WAN transports terminate on each edge connect gateway at the hub. With this design, each edge connect will have direct access to each WAN transport, creating an effective forwarding path for SD-WAN IPsec tunnel establishment. This is different than edge HA, which is normally used at a branch, where the WAN transports terminate on only one of the edge connects and then are shared via edge HA. We will discuss edge HA more in our branch design video. In this hub design, you'll notice we use a WAN switch stack to physically accept the handoff and then pass it to each SD-WAN gateway. Some customers choose to use VLANs off their existing infrastructure, while others will use dedicated switching. This is normally a simple layer two handoff, while the layer three is terminated on the SD-WAN gateways. It's important to ensure the transports at the hub have adequate IP space for the number of SD-WAN gateways. For example, if you are terminating an internet circuit at the hub, but only have a slash 30, you will not be able to accommodate both SD-WAN gateways. When it comes to LAN side integration, most hub SD-WAN gateways will connect via routed links and exchange routes with the LAN via OSPF or BGP. OSPF is a simpler approach and won't require redistribution if OSPF is running on the LAN switches. Some customers choose to use BGP for more granular control utilizing BGP attributes. In this example, where OSPF is used, we are setting the OSPF metric to always prefer the first SD-WAN gateway and only send traffic to the second SD-WAN gateway in the event of a failure. This is preferred over ECMP to keep flow symmetry. Many environments have some sort of back-end connectivity between their hubs. This could be dark fiber, metro ethernet, or a plethora of other connectivity types. It's important to ensure via routing design, each hub prefers the routes utilizing their local gateway over the gateways at the other hubs. Now that we've talked about the LAN integration, let's look at the WAN integration. First, let's discuss the underlay routing when connecting to various providers. This provides us reachability to build IPsec SD-WAN overlay tunnels. For things like commodity internet circuits or LTE and 5G connections, you normally will have a default route provisioned. This is commonly assigned via DHCP, but can sometimes require manual configuration when static IP addressing is used. Private circuits like MPLS will often have an eBGP peering between the provider edge and customer edge devices. For SD-WAN tunnel establishment, this peering is not generally needed and a default route will be sufficient as we only need to build reachability between the IP space within the MPLS cloud. However, many customers will leverage the BGP peering in place to provide route reachability between legacy sites still on the MPLS underlay and converted SD-WAN sites. Carefully consider at your hubs if you need the eBGP adjacency to remain for migration routing. Now that we've covered LAN routing and underlay routing, the last piece to the routing puzzle is the overlay routing. Edge Connect SD-WAN uses a protocol referred to as subnet sharing in the overlay to exchange routes between sites. From the hub, it's recommended to summarize routes and only advertise a hub summary. A default route is also generally advertised to cover various types of fallback scenarios and provide a backup path to the internet through the hubs. Other routes may be required based on specific routing designs. Peer priority is assigned to the routes when being advertised from the hubs, preferring a specific gateway when the same prefix is being advertised from multiple gateways, as we have here. This is done to ensure flow symmetry. That's a wrap on another VSG Expanded video. To summarize, in this video we discussed how to design SD-WAN hubs and integrate those hubs with your WAN and LAN networks. Let's review some key takeaways. First, ensure that you get the right SD-WAN gateways. Consider the amount of WAN bandwidth you need, the features you're going to deploy, the type of connectivity you want to have, and the number of IPsec tunnels. Work with your Aruba SE to make sure you get the right hardware. Consider if you want to deploy inline or out of path. Inline makes sense for most customers, but if you have very large SD-WAN deployments that require a lot of bandwidth, an auto path deployment might be the way to go. Second, consider the LAN integration. Try to avoid ECMP routes where possible to maintain flow symmetry. Give careful consideration to your routing design when you have backend connectivity between your hubs. 
Ensure your backend routes are only used when intended to avoid suboptimal routing or route looping. Third, when you look at your underlay routing, carefully map out how the routing will work during a migration. I've seen many customers forget this step and then not having routing reachability between their converted sites and their legacy non-SD-WAN sites. Finally, think about your overlay routing. A clean and well-summarized overlay will make your routing more predictable and understandable. With these things in mind, you should be able to tackle a hub deployment with ease. For more SD-WAN design guidance, as well as other great design, deploy, and operate content, check out the Validated Solution Guide linked in the description below.